So welcome back to our virtual CU Anschutz Alumni Series Happy and Healthy Hour. The series took a break this summer and we're excited to be back with new programs, kicking it off with our great speaker tonight. We're grateful that you're here today, joining us today to connect with the CU Anschutz alumni community and to learn about emergency wilderness medicine. I am Nia S. Mitchell. I'm a proud alum of the Internal Medicine Residency Program in 2008 and the Primary Care Research Fellowship in 2010 and also the CU School of Public CU School of Public Health in 2010. I am proud to represent the CU Medical Alumni Association, a partner for this series. For those of you joining us tonight who are alumni of the CU School of Medicine, the CU Medical Alumni Association offers many opportunities to connect with your fellow alumni and current students, including our upcoming virtual Silver and Gold Alumni Awards Banquet on October 28th, honoring seven of our amazing alumni award winners. There are numerous ways for all alumni from the campus to get involved. Our alumni team is always happy to help you connect with alumni activities for your college or school. And we'll share many ways to get involved and how to reach the team in a follow-up email to tonight's attendees. I now have the privilege of introducing tonight's speaker. Dr. Jay Limery is a professor of emergency medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. He's also the chief of the section of wilderness and environmental medicine and faculty in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health at the Colorado School of Public Health. Dr. Lemaria has expertise in austere and remote medical care, as well as the effects of climate change on human health. Dr. Lemaria is currently the medical director for the National, sorry, medical director for the National Science Foundation's Polar Research Program and a physician consultant to the exploration medical capability element of NASA's Human Research Program. He is a past president of the Wilderness Medical Society and past EMS Medical Director for the United States Antarctic Program. He also sits on the National Academy of Medicine's Roundtable on Environmental Health Sciences Research and Medicine. Dr. Lemery co-authored Environmedics, The Impact of Climate Change on Human Health and co-edited Global Climate Change and Human Health from Science to Practice. He was a technical contributor to the 13 US federal agency's fourth national climate assessment and co-author on the landmark New England Journal of Medicine study on excess mortality in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. He has also served as a consultant for the Climate and Health Program for Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Limery holds academic appointments at the Harvard School of Public Health, where he's a contributing editor to its journal, Health and Human Rights. Dr. Limery is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and currently serves as co-director for the University of Colorado School of Medicine's Climate and Health Program. I, like many of you, have been looking forward to hearing Dr. Limery's presentation. So without further ado, Thanks, Dr. Mitchell. I think we lost you at the end. I'm going to share my screen. One second, hang on. I think you're seeing my whole desktop, is that right, guys? Or is it just the PowerPoint slides? Is anyone? Anybody? <laughs> just a slide, okay. So just confirming you guys can just see my slides, not the whole, I think Zoom upgraded its software in the interim. All right, just the PowerPoint. Okay, cool, we're good. I'm gonna get going. Oh, hang on, get rid of. All right, thanks guys. So great to be here. Uh, this is exciting for me as well. It's, uh, it's happy hour for most of you. Um, and uh, what I wanna do today is just talk a little bit about our program how wilderness medicine fits into wellness, because that's kind of how I got into it, um, although it ended up being a bit of a career for me. Um, we'll talk about our programs at uh, the CU School of Medicine and the Andrews campus. Uh, I'm going to give you an, uh, just tell you a little bit about an opportunity to, in December to get together in Costa Rica with our program designed for the, um, the alumni group. And then I'm going to probably hopefully stop a little bit over halfway and just so we can Q&A a little bit. Um, so let's talk about stress in medicine, because this is something I've been feeling. I'm sure you guys, maybe not as, as much maybe, or maybe a lot actually. Um, and, um, just kind of go through 
you know, sort of a, maybe a co common thread for what we're all dealing with. I thought I'd take the opportunity to take a picture, show you a picture I took in the emergency department last Friday. Um, this is my, uh, my shift last week. And then while I was there, of course, everything was just clouded by this dang virus. And um, the charge nurse came and said, oh, hey, by the way, just so you know, uh, joint commissions here. And then there was a, uh, I was paged to the front where a courier said, I have a nice um, note for you from your attorney uh, asking me to uh, present later, later this year. And then of course, when I looked outside, I saw a bunch of people um, protesting against the vaccine, right? So these are, this is just a, a cynical snapshot of the very formidable forces that we're all dealing with in medicine. And I think it's, um, um, wellness is really, really important and something that we all strive to find. And um, along the way in my career, and I got out of residency about 15 years ago, I got this email from the Wilderness Medical Society. I just looked at it and I was like, oh man, look at that statement. Combine your profession with your passion. And I began to get um, more into it. And I thought, this is this is cool group doing neat things. Um, for those that are interested in this, there's the uh, group called the Wilderness Medical Society from all um, uh, healthcare providers, actually, including pre-hospital from all backgrounds. And it's at WMS.org. They actually have a thing called the Fellowship of the Academy of Wilderness Medicine. I just put this out there for those that maybe are interested in this. Um, it's a really cool group to get involved with that are doing great things. And if you ever wanna study this or travel or practice overseas um, or abroad in any capacity, it's a, uh, fantastic group and it's a group that's really um, housed in medic, best practice medical science and they do a lot of um, good work with its own journal. <clears throat> the reason I love to talk about this is that none of us can be a wilderness medicine doctor, even I'm not. I, I make my living seeing patients uh, in the emergency department at Anschutz, um, but all of us can be 15% wilderness physician and I think that that's just important to understand because it really helps us uh, have a hedge against the very, you know, the, the, the intense jobs of our clinical work. And if we can just be able to diversify our career, even 15%, that's enough to be able to mitigate burnout and provide a little bit of uh, texture to an otherwise, you know, uh, stressful clinical, clinical job. So Excuse me, Dr. Sort of throw that out there. Can you hear yeah, me? go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, we are seeing your presenter's view. Would you mind? Is there a way you can? <laughs> All right. Totally. Thank yeah. you. I'm sorry. I thought, yep. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Uh, how? All right, I'm just going to share. Sorry, one second. Let's do this. Okay. Perfect. I assume, yeah, okay, great. Sorry, guys. That's right. Yeah. That's perfect. Thank Anyways, you. You think you got zoomed out at this point, but there's always surprises and upgrades. So what I want to do now is just kind of give you a sense of what we're doing on campus. And one of the great things about what we do is we love to collaborate. So um, as I was thinking about this for another talk we have to our group, I thought, how do we represent all the very different diverse, diverse things we're doing because there's about five core faculty, about 10, you know, uh, invested faculty and about 20 faculty that are people that are coming in and, and doing different projects with us. So I sort of did this mock-up and if you just bear with me, it's just kind of an intuitive way for us to go through all the different things we're doing and can sort of share with you the breadth of this, of this field, at least our version of this field at CU. Um, so all these logos obviously mean something, and um, really, um, I'm going to talk to you in sequential, in clockwise order, talk about uh, the Wilderness Medicine Fellowship, all the educational outreach programs we do, the pre-health courses that we do, which we think is a really important constituency that medical education has really neglected. I'll talk more about that in two seconds. Um, the incredible activity around space medicine which is actually a thing at CU. Uh, polar medicine and, this, and the jobs that we, we do here. Um, the opportunities from digital education, everyone's moving fast into this and I could share with you my um, role as a campus liaison to the um, 
to the system office for the Coursera contract that we have. A little bit about research and innovation, um, our medical direction work and climate change and health. And basically just a, one or two slides for each of these. So I'm not gonna go too deep into them, uh, but this is us. <clears throat> these are the core principles. There's myself, there's Elaine Reno, who also works in the travel clinic. She's DTMNH, which is a diploma of men and hygiene. Todd Miner, who is our education director and an educator. Um, and he's gonna um, be leading this Costa Rica trip that we're gonna talk about at the end. And Martin Musi, our fellowship director and a true um, outdoorsman in the sense that he's, uh, he's the one that's really doing all of our technical um, activities in the mountains and very scary high places. And of course, Megan uh, Rivers, our administrator, who um, was outstanding and nothing would work without her. Um, so let's get into it. Let's talk about the fellowship. We have a GME fellowship. It's 12 months. We actually are taking physicians from all backgrounds, although we administer it through emergency medicine. Um, we've had uh, two internal medicine physicians take it as well. We deploy our fellow, which right now they're up at Summit Station in Greenland, supporting the National Science Foundation. And we have a, a diploma in mountain medicine course that our fellows participate in. And we actually co-direct one of them in the Andes. So it's for a healthcare provider of any background looking to gain technical proficiency, uh, if not just technical experience in, um, in things like this, which is a high angle rope rescue. And we do other things as well, a rock and snow symposium for all the front range search and rescue and ski patrol. Um, we uh, help with the URA Ice Festival and our fellows go and do an, a stint at the uh, NASA's Neutral Buoyancy Lab where they learn the most insane, which is the largest pool in the world where the astronauts float and learn the most insane uh, dive physiology. And again, sort of a one, one year well-rounded uh, fellowship in wilderness medicine. It really is, you know, the, we, we don't do this to train people necessarily to work in wilderness medicine because a lot of people can do that with just their medical degrees, but really to be to build leaders. So whether they want to be able to build academic careers or run, run their own search and rescue or medical direction team for national parks and so forth. And, um, you know, there's about 14 fellowships in the country right now. And I think, um, you know, really ours is, is up there. Our peer groups, Mass General, Utah, Stanford, New Mexico, those are the groups that um, we're often, um, you know, up there in that, in that top five category. So we're very proud of our program led by Drs. Moosey and Young. I put this logo here because it's our newest endeavor, which I'll talk about in a second, which is this is our outreach. And really, one of the things that we learned early on is that so many people want to do this, and we want to make sure we give people the opportunity to participate, whether it's, you know, um, board-certified anesthesiologists who are 30 years out looking to diversify within their career, uh, people that go to REI, um, on a Saturday, um, young people looking to get into the pre-health profession. So really, we um, built a very robust and broad educational program with this, you know, kind of sexy sales pitch, which is like, you know, medicine and Swiss Army knife. Um, so we run lots of courses. We, we certify people in wilderness first aid. Um, that's a 16-hour cert, wilderness first responder. So if anyone out there was a guide, a mountain guide or anything like that, you'll know that a WFR is a certification that lots of people look for to be river rafters or mountain guides or whatever. That's about 70 hours. Um, and again, it's stuff we do with, with lay people, but we also diversify into other things. We have a relationship with the 10th Mountain Huts where we'll go up there and teach um, basically a, a hybrid three-day course um, up at altitude. So heavy on the altitude, a little bit of avalanche, snow and ice survival, and that's for lay people and, you know, um, really, it's a way to sort of keep backcountry travelers uh, to teach them how to keep themselves safe in, you know, the crazy Colorado winter where if you're not paying attention, you're having a great afternoon, two hours later, the sun sets, temperature drops 30 degrees and, you know, um, you can be in a lot of trouble. So these are um, courses that we teach in partnership with Panther Mountain. We teach courses uh, in polar medicine, so people deploying to the Arctic. Um, through a Polar Field, which is a local Denver organization that employs a lot of people that work um, in remote industrial places in the Arctic and through a consortium of universities um, called University of the Arctic. And um, 
the wildland firefighter program, which just started where we're going to now, I mean, and you get that this is something that blew my mind. We have all these firefighters out West, um, <clears throat> as we gotten to know them, really, these, these are national treasures, right? These, these men and women out there fighting the fires, which are getting longer and more intense every year. And none of them have any meaningful um, first aid training. So now we have a contract with the Forest Service. We're just going to go to them and train them, you know, for two days in these wilderness first aid skills so they can keep themselves and their colleagues safe if and when um, with basic things like stop the bleed, you know, how to assess a patient, how to communicate medical information, how to take vital signs and things like that. And then um, another opportunity we've, we've had is doing something analogous with game rangers in Africa, where again, there's these, um, these uh, rangers there are not only out in the bush by themselves, often alone, but actually being targeted by poachers. So again, teaching them things like stop the bleed and um, uh, you know how to do basic first aid. Other things we've done with Oregon fisheries, uh, the first aid training for, uh, for the fishermen and global health advanced first aid, which is a sort of a three-day primer for, um, we came up with this a few years ago for all the people in academia deploying on behalf of the universities in a global health capacity with really not much situational awareness. So that was really where that course came from. So a lot, again, a lot of um, wilderness medicine um, principles sort of baked into those different situations. Um, this is probably our one of our flagship courses, which I love. This is, uh, may, may, many of you may know Vaughn Brown, who's a physician at Anschutz Emergency Department featured in the, in the circle there, a couple students, but it's a pre-med, course for students looking to enter the pre-health professions, you know, pharmacy, PA school, nursing, med school. And we run these courses really trying to give them a backstage pass to medicine. We let them shadow in our emergency department. Uh, for a time, we had EMS ride-alongs and we bring in sort of the best speakers and um, give them a chance to be excited about a career in medicine in that pre-health phase where, it, you know, maybe they'll have one pre-med advisor for a thousand students um, and really allow them to, to have some, you know, connectivity with others. And again, be excited about a career in medicine, which um, they don't often have that opportunity um, to do for all sorts of reasons. And we run courses in Colorado, of course here, uh, Costa Rica and the Channel Islands through a um, affiliation with Cal Poly. <clears throat> And here's just an example we do. We do fun things like cow heart dissections and then of course show them and show them the trauma bay uh, at uh, CU Anschutz as well. And give them again, sort of that backstage pass and you know, give them a little love because these guys are you know, staring at the MCATs and um, you know, wondering you know, if, they're gonna, if they're gonna make it. So um, it's important to have that um, outreach we think. Okay, this is my favorite here. This little logo here is the new space medicine program. So um, we started off a few years ago, almost as a dare to say, I bet you we can convince physicians to go live in a tin can in the Utah desert for a week and they pay for it. Um, and so this, we started this with a young uh, resident who built a curriculum around it. And sure enough, um, it was a CME, you can see here on, the, on the, um, the middle, the two Mars, which we run with the Wilderness Medical Society, where we have um, you know, a Martian simulation, and, which I'll show you in the next slide, uh, at the, at, at the um, Mars Desert Research Station. Since then, we've grown and we've created um, a course with aerospace engineering, called uh, Medicine in Space and Surface Environments, which is an undergrad graduate hybrid course um, with CU Boulder. And they teach two weeks in Boulder and then one week at the Mars Desert Research Station. And then we found funding for med students from NASA to teach the human space flight factors and medical risk assessment, which is uh, students are contributing to a NASA database for, for, uh, for, um, for health risk. If you recall, NASA is now switching from a footing of the space station to the moon and all the different uh, um, assumptions made for health risk are changing. And so we have our CU students helping contribute to that research. We're teaching them research best practice, um, rapid systematic review specifically, and it's all being fed into a NASA um, database. And at the same time, NASA is providing 
um, astronauts and flight surgeons to, to, to educate our students as well. So it's been a, a very fruitful um, collaboration. You can see here, here's the Mars Desert Research Station campus, um, which it looks like Mars. And then um, you can see here, uh, small living quarters, um, but people generally love it for a week. And right now we're um, actually in the process of talking to some interested donors about what would it take to build one of these for 20 people. Less realistic perhaps, but again, gives, gives all of us educators a chance to have a larger critical mass of people experiencing this um, at the same time. And then just to build on that, we now have some of us that are funded by the NASA's Human Research Program for doing just what I described, that, that clinical research um, um, you know, risk assessment and um, we are apparently one signature away, and that's not Anschutz, it's Boulder, but one signature from Boulder from launching a MD, MS in aerospace medicine, excuse me, aerospace engineering, which we think will be the, uh, the, uh, the health, um, phys the, the lead physician or uh, health officer of the future um, in, the, in human space flight. If, if you're a physician, and you can speak engineering, nothing will stop you. And we think that that's a skill that has not been met. And again, you know, we're sitting down with our colleagues at Smead Aerospace in, in Boulder and say, you know, if we do this, we can train the next cadre of people that are going to run the health systems for all the, um, the private uh, aerospace and space medicine, or, excuse me, private space programs and NASA as well. And then, of course, there's Space Force, which um, we have yet to understand exactly how they're going to impact Colorado, but it undoubtedly will be a huge presence. And we think um, building a program like this will have a huge dividends if we're able to capture um, the collaborations with um, our, na our nation's newest military branch. All right, rounding the bottom of the dial here. This is um, um, a pivot to the polar medicine program. Uh, a couple of years ago, we supported the Antarctic program. They're using their pre-hospital uh, providers which there's about 50 of them down there, mostly at the McMurdo Firehouse. And then uh, we pivoted to the North and now we're the medical director, directors for the National Science Foundation's uh, Polar Research Program, supporting 30 research teams throughout the circumpolar North and manning the clinic here, which is in, uh, you can see in the upper right, that star on the Greenland ice sheet. That is the, um, the Summit Station Medical Clinic. And um, it's, again, it supports all the, the researchers. So we're there providing um, uh, that, that contract for the National Science Foundation and our Wilderness Medicine Fellow is there right now. He'll be back in about two and a half weeks as the weather starts to really turn in the middle of Greenland. Um, just a short slide here to talk about digital education. You know, guys, when everything went, you know, um, pandemic, we couldn't have our students shadowing. And that's actually a huge problem for the pre-health students, especially PA schools who are demanding, you know, now they're demanding a thousand hours of shadowing or, or contact and these students just couldn't get it. So we just said, well, I don't know if this is gonna work, but let's stand up a virtual shadowing program. So we've done that. It's been very successful and we've used our simulation lab here at Anschutz to do that and give students a little bit of a shadowing experience with a little bit of education around it. And now um, um, sort of building on that, we're moving forward and have just been funded by Coursera, uh, of which the University of Colorado and the Anschutz campus is one of the larger presence on that platform, the Silicon Valley learning platform. And you can see here, here's a project we were involved with a few years ago, which is to get people um, close to becoming an EMT. And uh, now we're gonna give them a certification as a wilderness uh, first aid, which we think will be wildly popular simply because you know, it's so much fun to think about this stuff. Um, and um, so we're filming that now. It's, we're building it right now. Quick slide on sort of research. What are we doing for, for research? Uh, it's sort of all over the place as you can imagine, but you know, some three, three of our big wins was we've just been funded for a DOD project to um, think about how ultrasound, needle guided ultrasound, um, um, procedures, so venous cannulation and nerve blocks. And again, the DOD is very interested in nerve blocks in the, in the field because it, one, it doesn't alter the mentation of the injured uh, warfighter. And it also 
doesn't um, introduce narcotics, which of course is a huge problem for um, for all of all of society, but uh, as well as a returning veterans. So um, uh, our group has been funded to do that to develop some hacks to make that a little easier using um, using um, virtual reality. Um, Dr. Musi basically had one of the one of the seminal papers in um, in uh, the wilderness medicine literature this past year which is an upgrade of uh, staging of accidental hypothermia because you have to do it differently in the field because it's got such different implications than when we're in our tertiary care medical center. So that was a, he was first author on that paper. And then a bunch of us uh, provided um, in health affairs, um, one of the lead papers on, you know, why we need to train clinical and public health leaders in climate and health. And um, we're gonna get there in a, a few more stops. Um, it, and one more stop. So this is the uh, uh, last before climate change, the medical direction and outreach where um, we, you know, we're out there. We're at the Anschutz campus. It's so important if we're going to be in wilderness medicine, we have got to be out there. And we're, we're just never going to be as good as the people actually doing search and rescue in places like Denali or, or um, the backcountry. But we can get our people out there and train with them. So um, uh, Dr. Musi and several of our staff are on Rocky Mountain Rescue in Boulder, responding to you know, search and rescue and evacuations there. Um, we've uh, provided medical support for the URI Ice Climbing Festival, which is just an absolute blast to be there. Um, uh, and so that, that's great. And then also doing ski patrol as well. So we provide uh, medical direction for Eldora with the Bluebird Backcountry, which is this new concept of uh, a back all backcountry skiing um, uh, in Colorado and uh, other educational events like this rock and rock and snow symposium, which will happen in November. I can get um, you know through the team all you guys all that information if anyone's interested in participating or helping or any of that. And then finally, um, just want to talk about climate and health. And I got into this through wilderness medicine, thinking. You know, uh, we in wilderness medicine need to be leaders in this. And I just sort of started that. And here's a slide from the CDC for those that haven't um, thought too much about it. This is really, this is the money slide for climate change and how it affects health. The inner circle are the drivers for um, climate and health, uh, or excuse me, for uh, uh, climate change. Some say there should be only three, but whatever. There's, you know, increasing CO2, rising temperatures, which feed uh, sea level rise and extreme weather. The next circle are the um, earth science results of that, the consequences, and then the rectangle is the human health uh, impact from that. And really, it's all about this. It's all about, from my perspective, changing the conversation from uh, polar bears on icebergs to kids with inhalers and really lean into that um, you know, our ability for, for us, and this is Marcus Welby, who was one of the, the grand um, uh, science communicators in the old days, and really leaning into that idea of, uh, for all clinicians, those that wear the white coat, you know, we have the opportunity to, to be a trusted messenger, and um, that's what we wanted to lean on, and get away from altruism, you know, love your mother, save the whales, and abstractions, you know, parts per million of carbon dioxide, and really talk about our parents' risk of chronic lung disease and our kids' risk of asthma. Um, when we thought about a few years ago putting this together, um, we put together a textbook because we were thinking about, okay, what would the curriculum look like? Well, let's build a curriculum. Well, if we're gonna do that, we might as well have a textbook. So we came out with a textbook. And then a little fun vignette is that the students came up to me and said, hey, we read your book. And immediately I just felt defeated because I knew they were lying because no one can read a textbook because textbooks are horrible. They're just big and bulky and, and full of uh, you know, scientific details and just difficult to read as a narrative, right? You look up information there. So then with my, uh, my mentor who just passed away, the grandfather of wilderness medicine, Dr. Auerbach, we said, all right, we made up the name. Let's write a book where we, we speak from the voice of the clinician and basically say, we know sickness, this is sickness and begin to have put a visceral feel on what it's like to intubate an 11 year old in the South Bronx who blew through an inhaler 
because it's never been as hot or the air quality has never been as bad from the ozone and heat. And so that was really our, um, our, our, our message with, with the book. And honestly, you know, take the reader to the bedside and give context to what we have seen. Uh, and this is the snapshot from recently, but it could be, unfortunately, it seems to be repeating in the news cycles. But to give context to what we saw in Puerto Rico a few years ago, the Gulf Coast and the wildfires, and really um, through the medical lens, change our collective risk assessment. So through our work here, um, Dean Riley um, uh, has, you know, basically um, said, you know, it's time for us at CU to have a climate and health program where it's the only funded uh, program in a school of medicine that we know of. Other schools are schools of public health. And one of our flagship programs is that we are now uh, have physician fellowships in climate medicine, and we're taking physicians from all um, backgrounds. This year, we've got five fellows. Um, they're remote because, again, Zoom has given us the confidence that we could pull this together remotely. Um, so we've got two in Denver, one in San Diego, one in Pittsburgh, and one in D.C., uh, two EM, one family, two IM. And they all have federal uh, preceptor placements at the bottom there. We have one at USGCRP, another one at NOAA, CDC, uh, NIH, which now that preceptor has just moved to run the climate and health portfolio at HHS, brand new, and the EPA. And all these climate and health centers within these agencies are now, of course, reinvigorated with the new administration. We also have nonprofit partners um, up top with Healthcare Without Harm, which is a huge one, Medical Society Consortium for Climate and Health, NRDC, and others, including the Pain Institute which is an energy policy think tank at the Colorado School of Mines, which has been uh, very generous in welcoming our fellows because no one's putting a health angle on, the, on their, their awesome data. So it's really quite a rich collaboration. And then for those that cannot um, do a fellowship, of course, like those of us that are all working, um, in 2022, we're gonna start rolling out uh, professional development courses. And we're gonna actually have different courses for each of these bullet points. That, that is our aspiration and we're building it right now. And um, we're gonna, um, it'll be hybrid, you know, half remote, half on site, but it's also gonna have a visceral component to it. So we're gonna take some, a page out of the um, Wilderness Medicine Playbook and really uh, have site visits and lean in and go talk to people and see um, many of the uh, climate, effects and solutions in action. So stay tuned on that. Um, we're gonna be announcing more of that this fall, but we're really in the, the deep planning now, conceptual planning for that. Okay, so just to conclude, um, I'm just gonna turn this back to you all and say, um, for those that are interested in this, our uh, education director, Todd Miner is gonna run a course in Costa Rica. It's the dry season, it's spectacular. It's at an eco lodge, which we've been to. He's been there probably two dozen times, maybe more. I've taken our students. It's a completely dialed trip. It's a tourist road with a luxury bus. We were talking earlier. It has a real glamping feel to it. And um, it's for uh, our CU Anschutz alumni. And um, it's going to be in December. So Todd said, you must show these pictures. He took all of them. The wildlife there is insane. There's some crazy statistic, which I can't remember, which is um, some ungodly amount of biodiversity on the planet is within 50 miles of, of that preserve. And it's double, I think it's 12%, maybe 20%. I, I can't remember, but it's, um, it, it's magical. And Todd is basically, a, he's a tour guide and an educator all in one. And we'll have our, we'll have our whole team there. So some other people supporting as well. Um, so for those that are interested, um, and Kara can probably get you that information. Yes, we go rafting there too. And um, here's Dr. Brown bringing down the ultrasound, doing some wilderness medicine, uh, ultrasonography for those pre-health students, sort of showing them again that backstage into medicine. It looks like backstage to <laughs> this patient as well. Um, but it's uh, again, very exciting for them. And then of course we do scenarios too, like post earthquake, what do you do? Um, all right. 
and that's going to wrap my talk. I think I'm five minutes beyond where I wanted to be. Please send me an email. My legal name is John, so that's where you'll find me on the CU Anschutz server. Um, but delighted just to stick around and take questions and uh, just talk about ex shared experiences. Thanks, everybody. Okay, well, thank you so much for that very interesting talk. We have um, uh, several questions. I'm gonna start though, because I like this Costa Rica thing, I, I have these fantasies of being a wilderness, wilderness medicine person, but I'm not super outdoorsy. I like bathrooms. I just wanna make sure there are bathrooms on that trip. Like you're not just going in the woods. Yeah, I know. So everyone has their own cabana and there's running water. It's actually safe to drink um, because it's filtered. And it's in the tourist part of Costa Rica, so we just drink it straight. And I've never gotten sick. Um, I've been there four times, and my kids have gone. I've taken my kids. It's super kid friendly. The um, you have your own bathroom in your cabana. It's it's Spartan, right? The sheets are super. You know, everything's clean, but it's just Spartan. Um, but there's also a restaurant right there, and they serve you basically from 6 a.m. until 9 p.m. And they'll make you whatever you want. You have dinner served. It's a bar there, so everyone's you know having fun, and there's a pool around it's premises too. Um, it, it, if you so if you want to Google it, look at it, Hacienda Baru. Um, I'll put that in the chat, um, and that is uh, it. It really is magical. Awesome, thank you for that. And so I'll take our first question from the audience, and that's from um, Karen Arstead, and she says, "How do you talk about the impacts of climate change on health?" without the conversation becoming politically charged? Oh yeah, I mean, that's the question, right? So um, th there's lots of strategies for that. And I've learned from communication specialists and there's people that have leaned into communication for healthcare providers, but essentially there's, it, it's like anything else. It's just, it, it, you, we speak with authority as a healthcare provider. And I, don't, you know, when I'm in those conversations, I don't get, I mean, I, I, I don't lean into the politics of it. I say, look, here's the data. And this is what the data tells us. And just like I tell you, you need to take aspirin because it, and you, you know, you describe it, we're excellent communicators because it, you know, keeps the blockage to your heart, you know, keeps it open, blood flow, good things. Um, that's what we do. I also lean on the fact that we are not funded researchers as clinicians. You know, many of us are, but as clinicians, we're not. And we make life and death decisions on incomplete information all the time. And people trust us, right? Nurses are the most trusted provider. Uh, physicians are a close second. And so <clears throat> I say, look, you trust me with your life in the emergency room. Um, I am looking at the situation. I am not going to wait until I have 90% 95% proof that your mom has sepsis. I'm going to treat her for sepsis right now because I know the consequences can be so dire if I wait. And that begins a conversation where you can have, you know, a back and forth. It's right. It's not dissimilar to the, to the COVID vaccination conversation. Um, it's difficult, but again, as providers, we're, we, we know what we're doing. We know what we're talking about if we stick to the health. What I don't like to do is get caught up when somebody tries to bait me talking about, well, China and carbon capture and things like that. I have answers for that, you know, which is, you know, you know, the playground answer, which is like, okay, so if that person has bad behavior, we're not going to try and fix this. And we have such a potential for impact. But so I have answers for that. But in the end, my, um, our strength is the fact that we're healthcare providers and I stick to that line and I look at the data and analyze, you know, discuss the data like we do with anything else. You know, we have, um, we hold the public trust in so many ways and there's nothing different. So I think that that we just invoke that, that doctor patient relationship or, you know, uh, the clinician patient relationship. And I have to say, I love that answer about, you know, I'm not going to wait till I know that your mom is 95% sure she has yeah. sex we're going to treat. So I, I love that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. We're comfortable in that space. Right. I mean, that's what we do every day. We don't, we're, again, we're not funded scientists where you can't make those um, declarations until you present your data at a peer review conference. It's very different for us. Yes, absolutely. Um, so Jeff Barrett has a question for us. 
Any plans to offer micro credentials or courses in telemedicine in the space medicine program? Oh, that's great. Yes, great question. So there is the CME that we have, um, th that, but that is still alive. And no, we haven't done it yet, Jeff. We haven't. It's a great idea. We, we, have, we have to. <laughs> we absolutely have to. And then we have another question. Okay, how's this? And Oh, I love yeah. this question. I'm an internist, but this person asks, Ashley asks, if you could only learn two emergency med medicine skills, what would they be? Because I'm always thinking, whenever they're like, is there a doctor on board? They don't want me coming in being like, I need a blood pressure and a glucose, right? They want someone like you. So what skill, what emergency medicine skills, two oh, skills would you recommend? Yeah, great question. So, I mean, you know, stop the bleed, which I don't know that that's an emergency medicine. It's kind of a first responder skill, but, you know, suturing is good. You can, you can pick up a clat, go to a CME and learn how to suture. I, you know, I'm assuming you see many interns too, but you may not. Um, that's a good thing to be in the, in the field and doing that. And then, um, oh man, what else? Uh, you know, splinting 101 is a good thing to learn. Get somebody out of a jam and when do you splint and when you not. And the reason is, is that um, we spend a lot of time on decision-making for splint because it, when they're in our hospital or our clinics, it's a no-brainer, you, you splint. But when you're on the top of a mountain, you know, depending on what you splint, when can have huge implications, right? Are you going to, are you going to protect that C-spine? Well, you really better not because if you do, then you're assuming that patient can't walk out. And then what does that mean for that patient and your group? So we have much different standards of care in the wilderness than we do on Colfax. Um, so, per, you know, and, and it's all, you know, the wilderness medical society is great for that. You can go have fun. And I think, you know, it's hopefully Jackson Hole this summer and um, um, Snowmass next, or sorry, Jackson Hole this winter, Snowmass next summer, and they're great places. And again, it's a lot of fun people telling telling good stories. Yes. So, okay, so Taylor Taylor <clears throat> asks, says, "I'm outdoorsy, but a super duper sub specialist, peds endo. I love yeah. the wilderness, but would this be totally outside of my scope of practice?" Uh, no, because you already have a, a wonderful scope of practice in that you are a physician. Um, you are specializing in kids, you know, endo, perhaps that may not be as, as germane. Um, but there's simple things like the, check out the FAWM program. It's the fellow of the Academy of Wilderness Medicine. It's designed for all comers of anyone with a terminal degree or terminal certification. So that includes an EMT. Um, and like anything else, you can get as nerdy as you want. Um, but it, what it does is it gives you a chance to get some experiential knowledge and a chance to go to these conferences and, and affiliated conferences and pick up um, skills. And it, it, it really, there, it, it invokes your, your, um, your uh, background as a, as a care provider. And none of this is particularly, I mean, you can get the PhD level if you want, but really the FAWM is meant to provide a credential that when you look at your colleague, and talk about, you know, someone's trapped up in the high peaks tonight, you know, we better, here's what they're gonna be um, suffering from, uh, you know, and uh, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of going off. What we've seen in the past is a lot of people, because they're friends with a news crew or a news producer start talking about, you know, injecting heparin into their fingers to forestall frostbite, which, you know, horrible, horrible things. And this credential is meant to sort of say, hey, oh, you get it. But it's also meant to be, um, inclusive and welcoming because it's a it's a wonderful community and um anyway i hope that's a long-winded answer but i hope you answered it sure. um and linda B bishak um asked dr Lomis, thank you for sharing your knowledge and time with us what advice do you have for current medical students who want to pursue wilderness medicine particularly thinking about what you envision the field would look like in 10 20 and 30 years yeah, it's cool, right? Because what I love about wilderness medicine, it, it is not frontier medicine, right? There's clearly, it's austere medicine, but we're bringing all the best tricks we have with us. And so um, there's, we're diving into, um, you know, what great drugs exist. And this is the NASA NSF work, right? Because if we can bring it and it's small and compact and redundant, we can do it. So I, I, I think it's going to look we're gonna have all sorts of technical gizmos like we have, like ultrasound has completely changed the way we do imaging in an austere place. You know, every space camp medical clinic has an ultrasound and they can diagnose, you know, um, 
swollen optical discs and, and cerebral edema from just having an ultrasound, for instance. Um, but to your, answer your question further, with med students, um, all most med schools have a wilderness medicine elective. I'm not even sure that's true. Many do. But the Wilderness Medical Society absolutely does. And they do it twice a year. Uh, one in Colorado and one in, I think the um, staff, staff, the woman who runs it is doing it in uh, Virginia. But it's open to all comers. So there's that. Um, the Wilderness Medical Society conferences allow students to come for free to sort of help, you know, do conference tasking. Um, and, uh, you know, I always tell students, you know, you've got a, you've got a busy day job. You've, your job is to be a good med student so you can follow your path and become a resident. But when you do have some time off, you know, reach out to people around you and see if you can jump on a paper or abstract presentation or something like that. And um, uh, again, one of the best things you could do is, again, I say the Wilderness Medical Society because I was a part of it for so long, but it's also where everyone goes. Jump on a committee and offer to do, you know, yeah, I'll do the slide the slides for that topic for an education thing or whatever that's how you get to know people and by the time you get through residency and uh you're you're intending you'll have opportunities someone will be like hey man we had a beer last summer hey come on we're going to do a um you know we're going to do a project up at denali this summer can you come you know so things like that will open up um or you know go work at the divers alert network um you know so you'll you'll begin to know people on a first name basis who are who are doing all this stuff, whether it's in the field or even, you know, in the in the, you know, two dozen or so academic centers that have wilderness medicine programs, which again, that has real value for the would be resident and um, you know, um, getting papers and things like that, research opportunities. So another question. Um, what are the most prevalent effects of climate change on human health? Yeah, well, I go back to that slide because when people ask me that, I'm like, okay, well, there's there's the, the big ones, but like, you know, kind of going through the list, you think of water insecurity, uh, extreme heat, heat that energizes extreme weather, extreme downpours, um, vector-borne disease, and changes in um, uh, you, you know in disease exposure, um, food insecurity, and drought, um, wildfires, which not only cause incredible damage to the surrounding community, but, you know, nuke the air quality of, you know, of, of half a continent um, and cause respiratory distress, uh, displacement and trauma and emotional and psychological effects from that. Um, so, the, yeah, those are, the, those are the big ones off the top of my head. Um, you know, let me think of sea level rise and, um, you know, uh, the lack of, um, or the, you know, the disruption of people's, um, you know, coastal communities, storm surges, and, um, you know, even, um, uh, again, it, it goes a little bit into food security as well, because it, it disrupts fisheries as well. So, but that CDC slide is the, is the one I go to, because it's just all kind of right there. And um, yeah, sort of explains it elegantly. And I have a question. So, um, you know, as a native of New Orleans, you know, you know re recently experienced you know, yet another large hurricane. I'm wondering about, and, and I know that you had that paper about in the New England Journal of Medicine, no less, about hurricane relief in, was it Hurricane Maria? Yeah, it was Hurricane Maria, yeah. Excess yeah. mortality, yeah. Yes, um, the excess mortality. So can you talk about like what what is like sort of wilderness medicine in terms of like, oh, I want to go be a part of disaster relief? Because I think that was one of the upcoming uh, courses that you, you mentioned on one of your slides. Yeah, right. So it's it's basically going to be climate change um, with an eye towards disaster. Um, and so thinking about the disaster response system of the federal government becoming facile with that, um, I can't, I'll tell you, just between us, because um, uh, it, it's not set yet. So we're, we're good friends with people at uh, Texas A&M and Disaster City. And what our aspiration is, is to be able to not even be on CU campus to be like, hey, everyone, you know, take your first three or four days of the primer. We're all going to fly to College Station and we're going to go to Disaster City and play. Um, and what I mean play is do mock disasters where we all have different roles and they have a command center. And then it's worth it's worth getting on 
the internet and check this place out. They have um, a pile of rubble. And you're like, well, what's that? And you're like, well, that's a collapsed building. I'm like, I'm not going in near that. And, and then the instructor secretly says, no, 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 it's all reinforced safe, but there's some insane crawl spaces there. Go find the dummy um, of the person who, you know, who's trapped in the collapsed building. So what, the, what does that do? Well, um, to me, it's a sense of adventure. It gives us a, a visceral sense of the real uh, issues around a, um, you know, a building collapse, which you know could be caused by extreme weather, but it adds a context, a learning context to say, this is an incredible way to learn these core concepts of what, um, our, what do our communities face when they're confronted with climate disasters. And, you know, unfortunately, um, the only one I can think of that doesn't have to do with climate change is an earthquake, because everything else could probably be related to climate change in some way. And we know that that data is getting better, where the attribution, um, allow, we, are, we are now allowed to attribute um, intensity of storms to climate change. You know, that, that has come an incredible way. That was the last IPCC report that just came out, where that level of confidence, where we can say, you know, that, that conjecture and association is now allowing us to be a little bit more definitive with our science and talk about causality and um in, in contributions of climate change you know for okay simple thing the last the last point is the heat dome right um I, I think everyone gets that 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 weather the heat dome in uh the northwest where central oregon or seattle had 115 degrees right that that, that is quite intuitive for all of us to say that was because of climate change. It wasn't sort of that aberration of the, every thousand years there's 115 degrees, right? So we've gotten away from that and gotten, the science has allowed us to, um, to talk more uh, clearly and succinctly about that. Great. Um, I will say that um, I loved your, I, I wrote this down. If you're a physician and you speak engineering, nothing will stop you. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, I get, as a yeah. former engineer, I'm like, oh, this is awesome. But um, tell me, like, so is that just, was that just, do you think in reference to the space program or was, yeah. was, did, were you thinking about other things as well? No, it, that was absolutely the space program. Uh, it, well, clearly there's a lot. I mean, I, I, would, I would say I'm not an engineer, so I would say I imagine that you could be unstoppable, but yeah. clearly the space program. And here's why is that as I've gotten deeper into the NASA's human research program and my colleagues, we've all talked about, you know, we're educators, we come from a Right, on an academic campus, We're like, what can we do? And we know that there's groups out there that are training um, uh, what we call flight surgeons, which for those that may not know is a euphemism. It's, it's really a, a, a doctor assigned to people flying or going into space, you know, flight surgeon. There, there's nothing surgical about it. Um, and as we design systems to maintain health and wellness, you know, for, for the moon, which we are you know, spending a lot of money, government money on it. Um, we can advocate so far until the engineers, you know, who are advocating for their own projects say, well, why do we need that? That's stupid. And we say, well, that's really dumb. Why do you insist that we can't have that there? And then you end up in this and you're not speaking the same language. Um, so it's a cultural thing like anything else. And simply put, if we're going to train people to be effective in that role for the incredible opportunities. And that's what this is all about. It's like graduating students who can be leaders in the field for this growing field uh, is going to be, you know, incredible opportunities in the next decades. What do they need? And we, we sort of stumbled upon it. We're like, they need an engineering degree. And so we went over and talked to our friends at Boulder and they are good friends. And we said, well, what do they need? And they're like, you know, an, an MS should do it. A master's of science. They don't need to be a PhD. It doesn't need to be an MD, PhD. It really is just um, an engine, you know, that master's degree. And actually, we floated this past people at NASA and SpaceX. They're like, my God, that'd be amazing if you guys could do that. <laughs> and so, and so that's where we're at. Um, and, and you're you know, visiting that to be, would that be in was it the, the master's degree? Would that be a two year degree or a one year degree? Yeah, it's like, it's like um, it, there's a well worn path, right? It's like MD, MBA, MD, MPH. MD, a Master of, of Arts. So it would be a five-year combined. Uh, so it would be a, a four plus two, right? And then, but we, we shrink that into five. And, you know, Shanta Zimmer has been a wonderful collaborator, helped us figure this out at the Dean's office. And, uh, and Dean Riley, of course, you know, giving us a thumbs up from day one. He's like, you know, I love this idea. So there was some details to work out, but none of it was 
particularly challenging. They, mostly people just telling us, this is how you do it <laughs> from a combined degree perspective. No, that sounds awesome. Um, and I'm gonna ask one more question. So, you know, you talked about the research that the, where there's a fellow in the Arctic um, and there's some research going on. What kind of research is going on down, or I guess up in the Arctic? Yeah, well, to, to be clear, um, this, is a, this is a medical pr- um, support um, mission. So the fellow is actually there as a medical provider. Um, the incredible research is all the people there doing their earth science research like ice cores. And for those that don't know, the ice core, National Ice Core Laboratory is right here in Metro Denver, where all those ice cores from Greenland and Antarctica sit in a warehouse in Lakewood at 40 below. Um, so just a cool place to we go there with our students and tour it. Um, so they're not actually doing research. With that said, we had really hoped to do a high, al- a high altitude blood pressure research because Summit Station, the ice is so thick. It's actually about 10,500 feet there. Yeah. And um, we, were just, we were just late in the game, the NSF, we sort of tried to sneak it through, say, can, we, can do, we can do this, right? And the NSF was like, well, you really need to do a lot of paperwork before we let you do that. So we couldn't quite pull that off. Gotcha. Well, no, that sounds, I just remember, was it the Antarctica where there was a, the woman who had to like take out her own appendix or, or no, yeah. a breast tumor? I just remember, it was something crazy that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. There's a, yeah, that's right. So and this was, I think several decades ago, right? Or 20 years, 20, 15, 20 years ago, she took out yeah, her own, yeah, yeah. diagnosed mm-hmm. herself, took out her own. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. So um, do you have any final thoughts for our group here today? No, I mean, you know what, guys, please email me because we're always looking for collaborators. This whole thing has been fueled, if you couldn't tell, on just playing with other people. Um, It just makes for a much more rich environment. That's why we love working at the Anschutz campus because there's, you know, you're just surrounded by brilliant people smarter than yourself. So everyone's got cool ideas. And that idea about the micro credentials for space medicine. Duh. Yes, we should absolutely do that. We've got the curriculum built. And um, if you're still out there, please email me. Um, we should totally do it. Especially sure to give Jeff Barnett credit, credit for that. Yeah. Who was it again? I think it was Jeff Barnett. Okay, Jeff. Sure. Cool. I want yeah. to be sure that I have the right name. <clears throat> Jeff, cool. Bar- Jeff Barrett, B-A-R-R-A-T-T. So there. Okay. There. Okay. <laughs> well, it's funny. Yeah. Fun. Yeah, Beth. Okay. Jeff. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So thank you so much. What a wonderful presentation. On behalf of our attendees tonight and the CU Anschutz Medical Campus, I want to thank you, Dr. Lemery, for your insights and like just an interesting talk. And I, you know, again, I feel like I want to get out there and do something, even though I'm not super outdoorsy. So thank you. Totally. Let's keep in touch. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Real pleasure. All right. Have a good one. All right. Bye-bye.